Hi everyone, happy 4th of July. Thanks so much for joining us this morning before celebrating Independence Day. We want to take a few minutes to let you know what to expect in our service and share some details about what's going on at our church. Here at the Vineyard, we come to church with the expectation to experience God. As we gather, we're joining God's mission, transforming all things. So in today's service, we'll sing directly to God. We'll study the Bible together and observe a moment of silence so the Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts. And then we'll take time to respond accordingly. Our service will last just over an hour and you can follow along to know what's coming next. Check it out. If you're worshiping online today, just click the notes tab in the menu. Or if you're attending in person, you can go to votrweekly.org on your phone to follow along. Both options will give you today's order of service, song titles, sermon notes, announcements, and next steps. If you're new to the Vineyard, we'd love to connect today. So we've set up next steps as a simple way to introduce yourself. Online, look for the next steps link in the menu. It opens a quick form. And be sure to say hello in the chat and let us know where you're attending from. For those gathering in person, click the Next Steps tab at votrweekly.org and use the digital form. Or grab a Next Steps card from the back of the chair, fill it out, and drop it in an offering box. We'll reach out to you this week to follow up. At The Vineyard, we believe joining God's mission, transforming all things, is for everyone. That each person in our church family has a special spot to serve in the kingdom of God. Whether it's in Vineyard Kids or the production team or greeting at the front door, we want to help you find your place. Use the weekly to let us know you're interested, and we'll follow up to tell you about opportunities. Our church is completely funded by the generosity of people joining God's mission, transforming all things. And we're amazed at how God uses our donations to form our hearts and to transform the world. Instead of passing offering baskets, we have boxes in the back of the sanctuary where you can place your gift. You can also give online. Just tap the giving link and follow the prompts. If you just arrived, we're glad you're worshiping with us today. Check out this recap of our announcements. Service is starting in just a few seconds, and we can't wait to worship with you. Whether you're on the live stream or you're in the sanctuary right now, we want to invite you to stand as you're able and lift your voice as we sing to God. Let's read Psalm 123 as we prepare our hearts. I lift my eyes to you, O God, enthroned in heaven. We keep looking to the Lord our God for his mercy, just as servants keep their eyes on their master, as a slave girl watches her mistress for the slightest signal. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy, for we have had our fill of contempt. We have had more than our fill of the scoffing of the proud and the contempt of the arrogant. Good morning, Vineyard family. Let's stand as you're able. We want to invite you into a few moments of singing. Happy 4th. Let's celebrate freedom this morning. Every song we sing, every word we say, every melody, every note we play, every heart that's Every hand that's lifted up in prayer, it's all for you, Jesus. It's all for you, Jesus. All of the glory, the power, and praise be yours. Setting sun in the sky ablaze 
again. All of the glory, all the power, all the praise is yours forever. All of the glory, power, and praise be yours forever. All the glory, all of the glory, power, and praise be yours.
so much for worshiping with us. You can have a seat. If you're in middle school, we want to send you to your class. Uh, Brian is in the back, ready to take you across the hall to your classroom. Uh, everyone else, we have a quick video for you. After the resurrection, Jesus showed up to some of his followers on the road to Emmaus. He taught them how all the prophets, all the scriptures, and all the Old Testament pointed to Jesus. Their response was simple. Didn't our hearts burn within us? Let this be our prayer. Lord, open our eyes to see and make our hearts burn for you. Good morning. Happy Fourth of July. It is, uh, it is good to be worshiping together. Thank you so much for joining us this holiday weekend, whether in person or online. Welcome to our online community this morning as well. If we've never met before, my name is Jeff. I'm the lead pastor here at the Vineyard. And my family, we just got back from a, an epic two-week vacation. Well, not so epic because it was in the Midwest. And God bless the Midwest, but we're thankful to be from the Midwest and living in Colorado. Um, no, it's, it's, a great place. it's a great place to go visit family, uh, but we left Omaha and it was 106 degrees and like 80% humidity. And I left praying, dear God, help save these people. <laughs> Why on earth are they living here? This is crazy. Um, no, most of our family is still back in the Midwest. It was great to see them. And I ran a marathon, which was like brutal and awesome kind of at the same time. My legs still are pretty angry at me. And then the rest of the time, we, we just got really lazy and sat, sat, uh, sat around the lake and did nothing. It was really great. And I just want to say thanks to the team here at the Vineyard because there's such a good pastoral team and staff here at the Vineyard that, that we can leave and literally not think about you know, what's happening, just trusting the team that it's going well, and it really allows Natalie and I to unplug and, and recharge a battery, so very, very thankful for that. But as always, we're, we're excited to be here, we're excited to be home, to continue the series this morning, as you saw in the, in the video called Burning Hearts, all based from this beautiful passage in Luke 24, where Jesus starts to teach his disciples how all of the writings of Moses, all of the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ himself. Excited to continue that this morning. So let's pray, and then we'll jump in together. God, thanks for rest, and thanks for the opportunity to spend time together with family, whether that's on vacation or, or a holiday weekend like this. God, thank you for the opportunity to celebrate the freedoms and the independence that we have, and and as we look to your word, God, we pray that you would fill me with your presence. I, I pray that you would speak through me this morning and that you would open up the word of God to all of our hearts. Because we are desperate to hear from you, Jesus. And we know that without your presence and without your anointing, this at best is just somebody talking for 20 or so minutes. But we want to hear from you. So would you come now in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. Well, growing up, uh, I always loved animals. Always loved, still to this day, love animals, love being out in the wilderness and watching wildlife, love watching all of the little animal shows on Nat Geo or Disney Plus with our kids. We, I still love doing all of those things. And when I was really young, I would frequently try to catch animals from around our house and make them my pets. So whether it was like toads, frogs, bugs, anything I could get my hands on, at one time I had caught a bull snake, and I, and I really wanted this newfound bull snake, this little guy, to be my new pet. I was probably about 10 years old at the time, and so I wanted to bring him into the house, set up like a little terrarium in my room, and make it my newest pet, but my mom was having nothing to do with it. And so I took that as a little bit of a challenge as a young boy on how persuasive or persistent I could be. And then I would flash that smile, you know, that tried to get the mom's heart to melt and bend towards the 10-year-old's will. 
And I don't know if it was the persuasiveness or the persistence or the smile or some combination of all three, but finally she relented and said that, yes, I could bring this bull snake into our home. The only problem was I had no idea how to take care of a snake. I had no idea how to take care of a snake, and apparently the top of my reptile tank wasn't on tight enough because just after a couple of nights, I woke up to my surprise and the snake was gone. It had pushed its way out of the terrarium, and now it was on the loose somewhere in my house. I didn't have the guts right away to tell my mom that now this was a pet for everyone to share. She didn't sleep very well for a couple of weeks. My dad finally convinced us that the snake probably found its way outside knowing where it needed to go. But I always like to imagine that it moved from room to room using the AC ducts and just kind of poked its head up out of the vents before slithering back down somewhere around the house. And we never, I'm telling you, we never found that snake. I bet there's a small snake skeleton somewhere in that house. (laughs) We never found it. Fast forward to my bachelor years before Natalie and I were married and living together, and sure enough, I I thought again, this is time to have a pet snake. So I went and I bought a boa constrictor, just a small one. I wanted it to grow and mature with me into the years ahead. (laughs) Right? And, it, and it, was, it was great, but I have this, I have this distinct memory. It, it, it was short-lived. I had this distinct memory because Natalie and I were engaged. We were getting ready to move in together. And she said, hey, before we get married, you need to get rid of the snake. The Faust family is not a snake family. <laughs> and our apartment's not going to be big enough for you, me, and the snake. And so I found a, a friend that was able to take the snake in. And it was easy to move on because I was so in love and ready to to become a husband. And I, and I realized, like, this, uh, I mean, a lot of snakes, even the groans of the snakes, right? If you hate snakes, you're ready to leave. And I never use snake illustrations, but already in the calendar year of 2021, I've already had two passages that talk about snakes. This is the second one. So when you're sitting in your office and you're researching and you're praying, and you're reading about all these Old Testament stories where snakes are, you just can't help but remember some of these childhood memories, Just fantastic. And I can promise you that today's passage, it will eventually point to Jesus. We'll go from snakes to Jesus by the time is over. And it's it puts my stories at a very PG rating because this gets pretty interesting pretty fast. Let's look at Numbers 21. Gonna read verses four through nine together this morning. Then the people of Israel set out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey, and they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness, they complained. There's nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes." So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord told him, make a replica of the poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of the bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. I mean, there's a lot of questions from this text raises up all kinds of different questions, and it's really a quite, quite a fascinating text. I mean, there's complaining and, and snake bites, death, discipline, healing, so many layers, so many different things going on in this text. It had to have been a crazy time to live. And yet this whole series and the whole summer, we're taking passages like this one in Numbers 21, and we're connecting the dots from the Old Testament to Jesus and pointing how it's like a, a perfect highway from all these stories directly to Christ. I have found that one of the best ways to engage Scripture, particularly Scripture in the Old Testament, one of the best ways to begin seeing Christ in these Old Testament stories is to ask two questions when I approach the Word of God. You can steal the questions if you'd like or use them or try them out, but what I want to do is 
I want to present the two questions, and then we're going to kind of work our way through those questions this morning. The questions are simple. How do I see Jesus, and how does this impact me? Every time you engage in the Word of God, every time you open the Bible, if you ask those two questions, whether you run across a passage like this in Numbers 21 that maybe doesn't make sense right away, or something from the Gospels, you can ask these two questions. How do I see Jesus in this text, and how does it apply to me? What is God up to? How can I be fascinated with Jesus and and experience his love or compassion or even discipline, if that's what the Scripture is talking about? And at the same time, how is this impacting me? How does it speak to me about my purpose or calling or my relationship with others and with God? How do I see Jesus, and how... Does it impact me? This morning, we're going to start on the human side of this equation, the question, how does it impact me? And and as we wade into those waters, I want to start by offering you a summary sentence about this text. You will get tired and hurt, but you can be healed. You will get tired and hurt, but you can be healed. Be healed. If you read the scripture asking the question, what does this show me about myself? What does it teach me? Or how does it apply to me? Then this sentence is one of the ideas that you can walk away with. Because I'm sure we've all realized, whether it's my journey, your journey, or our collective journeys, they're long and hard. They have ups and downs. There are times where I will get tired and even hurt, but I can also be healed. Look at verse 4 and 5 with me one more time. But the people grew impatient with the long journey. And they began to speak against God and Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness, they complained. There is nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we have this horrible manna. And maybe it's because I just like drove halfway across the nation in a minivan with three kids all under the age of 10, but they sound like little children to me. They sound like hungry, tired children. God, we're tired. We're, we're hungry. We're thirsty. We, we liked it better as slaves in Egypt than out here free. God, where are you? And the person you put in charge stinks. Moses, we don't like you. Right? In so many of these early stories, as you read the Old Testament, the MO of the Israelites is, is one full of, of exhaustion and complaining and, and kind of rebelling against God and the leaders that he's put in charge. And I would say more often than not, God did something miraculous for the people of Israel out of his compassion despite their attitudes. You don't like slavery, God would say? I I'll rescue you and give you freedom. You're tired? How how about a cloud by day to offer you shade and a fire by night to offer you warmth? Are are you thirsty? Those are the complaints I'm hearing. Watch Moses, Moses speak to a rock in one time and hit a rock another time and enjoy your sweet tasting water. Are you hungry? I will literally feed you from food that will float down from heaven to provide for you. This is how God consistently interacted with the Israelites, miracle after miracle after miracle, and yet they go over and over again, no, we want something else. We don't like that snack. We don't like that drink. We want, we want something else. Give us something else. This is horrible. We can't take it anymore. If that was me, and I was driving in that car, I would threaten to turn the car around so fast (laughs) and go right back where we came from. And God is God and I am not. So that's like a collective amen, right? That's like a really good thing for us. God consistently showed up with miracles to provide and to care with compassion for his children. And unfortunately for, for you and for me, despite God's kindness and compassion, the Israelites, they, they're kind of a picture of how we live from time to time. When we're tired, when we're impatient, when we're hungry, when things aren't going our way, these are the moments when our filter is low and our mouth tends to be big. 
And we are going to get tired. On the journey of life, we're we're going to have days where things aren't going well. We have no idea what God is up to. We have no grid for how he's interacting with us. We don't maybe understand the leaders that he's placed in our lives, and we're tempted to gossip and complain and accuse God and others for all of our misfortune. And we have to fight that urge. We have to fight that temptation because I would say that both complaining and contentment Contentment are contagious. The more often you complain, the easier it's going to be to complain. The more often you sit in contentment, the more that's going to become a reality for your mind, your heart, and your life. On your journey, there's there's no doubt we're going to be tired. There's going to be seasons of impatience. And it's in those moments that we desperately need to respond with godliness. Because if we respond with sinfulness, sometimes pain can follow. Sometimes pain can follow. We don't always feel the pain in the midst of sin. Sometimes the gift of God is mercy and compassion. But we have to remember that that sometimes sin does lead to pain. That sin hurts not only ourselves, but it can impact the people around us. Compassion can absolutely, and, and mercy absolutely is one of God's response, but sometimes discipline is too. The snakes come. Some are bit, some even die, but it didn't take them very long to repent. If you look at verse 7, it says, then the people came to Moses and they cried out, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. I mean, they immediately go to Moses. They immediately go to him and they they confess. They, They say, we've messed up. We're sorry. We, we've sinned against you. We've sinned against God. Pray for us. Help us. Pray that God would take away the snakes. And I realize, like, in church, it's not that common to talk about pain and sin anymore. It's not that common to have these kinds of themes. It's, it's more common to skip these types of scriptures. And, and quite honestly, I, I think most of the time that happens because churches don't want to be viewed as judgmental. They don't want to be viewed as condemning. I mean, I surely don't want to be viewed that way as a, as a pastor, as a preacher. And I know our church, we don't want that to be the feel of our church at all. But this scripture is far from either of those things. This is just sometimes a, a real outcome of sin. That sin can hurt. That initially it might seem fun or even irrelevant, right? But any honest look at our own lives, we can realize that sin does impact us. It hurts our heart. It hurts our relationship with God and with others. And thankfully, God provides a promise for healing. In verse 8 and 9, God told Moses exactly what to do in order for the people to be healed. He said to make a replica of the snake that is bringing the pain, to stick it on a pole, to lift it high up so that everyone can see it, and anyone who looks at the snake would be healed. I do find it interesting, maybe you thought the same thing when you, when you heard the text, that God just didn't take the snakes away. They were still there. The pain was still there from a venomous snake bite. You know, when fangs pierce your skin, it probably still hurts. But God gave them an opportunity and a way to be healed. And and I wonder, when I think about this story, I wonder how many Israelites refused to look at the object that would offer them healing because they were confusing it with what brought them pain. And their lines got crossed up and all of a sudden they couldn't see and have faith for what God was inviting them to do. I mean, what do you want to bet? There were people who died in their sin instead of finding life in the promise of God. Maybe they rationalized to themselves by saying, is this really the only way God is going to bring about healing? Is this really the only way that he's inviting us to interact with him right now? I wonder if we can create another way to ease the pain and to find life. I mean, I, I think in all of our humanities, we've probably, we've probably tried to find healing in our own power from one time to the next. But we need to look to God's promise because the, the quicker between the pain, the quicker we can get from pain to looking 
at the promise of the Lord, it shortens all of that time. And all of a sudden, we begin to experience this divine healing quicker and quicker and quicker. In your journey, there's no doubt you're going to get tired. There's no doubt you're going to experience pain. But God has promised there's an opportunity for healing. And the awesome thing about the Bible, right, according to this text, as we unpack Numbers 21, is that according to the text, all of those things can be true, and all of those things are are good and valid points for the way that we engage with Scripture. And we could spend a whole sermon just looking at those things this morning, but remember, we have a second question that we need to be asking. We need to ask, what does this passage tell me about Jesus? Jesus. And this whole series, the whole Burning Heart series, it it came from Luke 24, as as the video mentioned, as I already alluded to, when Jesus began teaching his disciples how all of the writings of Moses pointed to him. And verse 9 is the best place where you can see this direct connection to Jesus. Verse 9, so Moses made a snake out of the bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. Again, all of this is is about Jesus. It's a direct line and a direct correlation between the snake being lifted up and Jesus Christ being lifted up. And it can seem strange at first because oftentimes in the Bible, serpents are considered bad. And at first in this text, they are, right? Initially, the snakes are used as discipline or, or punishment to the sinful Israelites. And then the next thing you know, the curse itself gets lifted up on a pole. And whoever looks at the cursed snake is now healed. They begin to experience salvation and deliverance from this judgment. They begin to experience healing. This is a foreshadow of the faith that we need to have in the cross, the curse in this passage from Numbers was lifted up on the pole, and Jesus Christ, later on in the Bible, it says that he became the curse for us, lifted up on the cross. And the same faith it took the Israelites to fix their eyes on the snake that had been lifted up, it takes us that same faith to look on the one who was lifted up on the cross. The scripture's all about Jesus. Jesus himself taught us this very truth in probably the most famous passage in all of the Bible, John 3. John 3, 16 in particular, it starts, you probably know it, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that anyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But the the two verses that precede John 3, 16, Jesus begins to unpack this story. Look at John 3, 14 and 15, a direct connect to Numbers 21, John 3, 14 and 15. And Moses, and as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. The very next verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. The bronze snake was about so much more than tired and impatient and complaining Israelites who were wandering through the desert, being disciplined for a variety of rebellious attitudes. It was about salvation and deliverance and healing from day one. It was about healing from this eternal sickness that separates all of us from God and our sin. It was about a promise yet to come, fulfilled totally in Jesus, uniting us to God forever, allowing us to experience His kingdom and promise us new life in Christ. I imagine Jesus on the road to Emmaus teaching his disciples about the Old Testament, and I imagine him getting to Numbers 21 and beginning to unpack how that story points to him. And just saying, as as the bronze snake was fastened to the pole, I was fastened to the cross. As the snake hung from the pole, I hung from the cross. And in the economy of God, Jesus became the curse so that we could become healed. And it takes faith and belief and a surrendered life beholding the cross. 
The Bible teaches us that we've all fallen short, that we've all turned our back from God, and this is the eternal sickness that I'm talking about, this eternal separation from God that we all want to avoid. But the Bible also teaches us that God has been making a way for reconciliation since the beginning of Scripture. That he's been making a way for reconciliation between God and humanity since the beginning of Scripture, and it's completed and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We saw it with Abraham and Isaac when God provided the sacrifice. It was reinforced in Chaz's message when he talked about Jacob's ladder and how Jesus came down to us so that we could also ascend with him and be released as missionaries to the world. We saw a shadow of the promise last week in Matt's message of the sacrificial lamb and the Passover meal. And here we go again. This time, it's a snake being lifted up, pointing directly to Jesus and pointing to the cross. But here's the thing. Just as he didn't force the Israelites to look at the snake was lifted up, he's not forcing you to look on the cross. It's in your best interest. It's the place where you find healing and reconciliation, but he's not going to force you to look At the cross, we need to respond. We need to respond with faith to that call. As you look at this passage and you see it connected to John 3, 14 to 16, I think the call for all of us is is quite simple this morning, that we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix them. Fasten them to the cross. Don't get distracted. Don't let the pain distract you or even all of the the substitutes that the world might offer you that will eventually crumble in comparison to the cross. Instead, fix your eyes on Jesus. It's been really interesting to watch the culture in the last few years, particularly the last five to ten years, but especially right now as well. We live in an era where there are more books being written about self-help than than ever before. We're in a social media society where you can become famous for promoting self-care and a self-centered culture when when one of the dominating narratives declares that self-healing will start with self-reflection. And I want to offer you this morning a biblical biblical and Christian perspective on that. Instead, fix your eyes on God. Jesus. The Christian worldview doesn't say that self-reflection is bad or that self-care should be ignored. We just got back from a family vacation where we did a lot of that. But the Bible does teach that Christ needs to be at the center of all of those reflections. That the cross needs to be the beginning and the end of all of those processes. Self-reflection and self-care is vital, but You can't be the author of your own healing. The Bible teaches us that Jesus, that his death and resurrection needs to be at the center of all things. And it's it's almost a Christian paradox to say that you can't be at the center of your own self-reflection, but it's true. Jesus needs to be at the center of that. And every time you replace Christ with yourself or an influencer or a blog or, or anything in the like, any time you replace the center of that reflection with Jesus, you are going to experience, you are going to experience something that pales in comparison to what was accomplished on the cross. Instead, we need to enter into that space, training ourselves to fix our eyes on Christ, the one who was lifted up so that we can receive our healing. I want to close with just an example of what that can look like, of what self-reflection or self-examination can look like, not with you at the center, but with Christ at the center. If you think about this passage, if you think about your own life kind of juxtaposed over this passage, the journey of it all, the ups and downs, the exhaustion, the complaining, the the gossip, the mistrust of God and people, the sin, pain, even the repentance and prayer, and the snake being lifted up now knowing that it resembles Christ or is fulfilled with Christ being lifted up on the cross. As As you think about all of those things and you think about your life, then let me ask you, how close are you to the cross? In that moment, in that journey, as you self-reflect, how central is the cross to that journey? 
What's your proximity to Jesus? Can you fix your eyes on the cross? Are you, are you close enough to embrace the cross? Are you walking or, or running towards him? Or maybe you're walking away and occasionally glancing over your shoulder back at all that he's done for you. Do you feel stuck, not knowing which direction to go? How close are you to the cross? I want to implore you this morning to start and to finish with Jesus, to fix your eyes on the cross. It's the safest place to reflect and to pray and to talk to God. And if you'll make a habit of sitting at his feet and embracing the cross, you might be surprised by the amount of healing you experience as you worship the one who was lifted up for you and for me. Let's pray. God, thank you for your presence. Thank you that we can see you in all things, that we can see you in these stories from the Old Testament that that from the beginning of time, you were making a way for us to be reconciled. That from the beginning of time, you were, you were creating substitutes, foreshadows at first and fulfilled completely in Jesus. Help us to rely and believe and have faith and completely surrender to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Here at the vineyard, after every message, we always create an opportunity for you to sit quietly with the Lord, to process everything that you've just heard, perhaps over the course of the last 20 or 30 minutes, God's been speaking to you personally about something. He's been high, he maybe highlighted something from the message and been talking to you about it. So we always create this opportunity for you to sit and reflect and to pray, because if we move too quickly to whatever is next, we can oftentimes miss what God might be saying to us right here and right now. So we're just going to draw the lights down. The band is going to play quietly. We encourage you to sit and to pray and to reflect, fixing your eyes on Jesus. I would encourage you during this prayer time to, to take note of your proximity to Jesus in your life right now and ask. Ask him if he'll draw you closer still. Take this time for yourself. In a few moments, I'll be back up to lead us into a time of ministry and response. In addition to creating a time of quiet reflection, we always also want to create an opportunity for you to respond to what God might be doing in your life, to respond individually and collectively. There's a variety of ways you can do that this morning. You can worship with us. Our team will lead us in a few more songs, and we would encourage you to lift your voice, to make these lyrics your prayers, to, to cry out to God this morning. If you came prepared to give as an act of worship, you can do that online or by using the boxes in the back of the sanctuary. And every Sunday we gather, we always want to create an opportunity for you to receive prayer, for you to be ministered to, knowing that this is just one of the most important things that we do when we gather. We create space for God to minister to you, to your heart, to bring healing, to, 
to bring compassion. And so every Sunday when we gather, we always create an opportunity for you to receive prayer. Our prayer team is in the back and they would love to pray for you for anything that you might be going through this morning, whether it's related or unrelated to this talk. If you're viewing with us online, you can click the the prayer button and one of our staff members will open a private chat window with you. Love to pray with you this morning. In particular, as I was kind of just sitting with the Lord and asking him about this prayer time and this message, there's just two things that that have been laid on my heart. One, I think there are some of us that are probably trying to solve problems outside of Christ. And this text could be a reminder for us this morning that it's not just surrendering one thing or or not just looking to the cross for one area or two areas in our life, but actually going to Him with everything. And if there's anything outside of, of the shadow of the cross, that He would want that to sit at the cross as well. And so as you just pray about your own life, maybe there's problems that you're struggling to solve. Listen, wisdom can come from God. Wisdom can come from God. And if that's you, we would love to pray for you this morning and just surrender that problem, whatever it may be, to the Lord and ask Him for a godly solution. And then also, I, I feel like we, there's some of us maybe in this room or, or even tuning in online that this whole idea of the snake being lifted up or the cross being lifted up and God not forcing us to, to look at it for our healing, God not forcing us to, to view that and, and to present our hearts to Christ in that way, it kind of struck you, it kind of stirred within you. And maybe you realize, man, I've always seen the cross or I've always seen Jesus or I've always heard about a relationship with him, but I've never actually thrown myself onto the cross. I've never actually fixed my eyes on Jesus and surrendered everything to him. And if that's you this morning, I wanna say it's important for you to do that. It's important for you to throw all of your faith on Jesus. And to say, I surrender everything to you. If you've never done that this morning, we would love to pray for you so that you can start an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ and begin experiencing the kingdom breakthrough in your life from this day forward. If that's you, we would love to pray for you this morning. But of course, we'll pray for anything you might be going through. Let me pray over the room and then we'll respond as God leads this morning. Holy Spirit, would you fall upon us right now? We know that you are everywhere. We know that you've been with us this entire time. We we pray now that you would stir within us. Help us to respond to you this morning, God. Help us to look to you with everything that we have to fix our eyes, our hearts, and our lives upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go get prayer. Let's worship together in a few songs. I'll be back up to close the service this morning. With me, fast falls the even tide, the darkness deepens. Oh Lord, with me abide when other helpers fail and comforts flee. Help of the Abide with me. Thou on my head in early youth did smile, and though rebellious and perverse me.
thy presence every passing hour what but thy grace can for the tempter's power who like myself my God and stay Abide with me. Let's sing abide with me. Abide with me. Abide with me. If thou art with me, then here is all I
Thank you for the cross. Thank you that you came and you died our death. You came, you became the curse on our behalf. And as as you were lifted up, would you help us to fix our gaze and never turn from all that you have done? And as we go from this place into our worlds and into our everyday lives, would we carry the cross with us? continually remind us and draw us back to the cross and help us do the same for others in our world. We love you and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us and joining us. It's great to see you all. It's great to be back. Have a, a great 4th of July weekend. Have fun tonight and enjoy, enjoy the holiday. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.